Hello everyone, this is Mark. This is my timeline presentation called A Look at American Curriculum. When reading the text, I found myself saying over and over that the same cycles were repeating themselves. We were having the same debates at staff meetings and curriculum planning in the 21st century that they had in the early 20th century. As an art teacher, it is at times hard to relate to this material, so I need ways to make it concrete and relevant for me. I do not agree with all the people who I chose, which makes sense, for many of them disagreed with each other. Rather, what drove my decisions for people to look at and include was which people represented ideas that I still see myself discussing with today, as in who'd be in my staff meeting. As such, I chose the following people. Charles Eliot, G. Stanley Hall, John Dewey, Edward Ross, John Franklin Bobbitt, Calvin M. Woodward, W.E.B. Dubois, Jane Adams, William Hurd Kilpatrick, William Chandler Bagley. Charles Eliot was a humanist and a mental disciplinarian, though he differed in some degrees with the others. He believed that anything could be a subject if you can study it over time. I learned from Encyclopedia Britannica during my quest for an image of him that he removed the required courses at Harvard because he didn't want it to be too restrictive. He argued for electives at the secondary level and a compromise was made within the Committee of Ten for there to be four courses of study at high schools as a result. He also wanted the same curriculum for all students, whether preparing for life or college, and it needed to include access to sciences and humanities. By 1908, he was in favor of sorting students by probable destinies, though. The electives he fought for are still present today in secondary schools and have even expanded. I would argue that you also see his influence in movements like democratic education where the students have total control over what subjects they are learning. Though it pushes the envelope farther, he was the first to push for student choice, aka electives, in learning, so it all stems from him. G. Stanley Hall is a developmentalist and regarded as the founder of child psychology and educational psychology. Through his research, he, quoting the textbook here, concluded on the basis of his investigation that teachers assumed too much about the contents of children's minds. That quote is from page 12. There he was referring to Boston kids knowing what a cow was. But this was interesting for me to see differences in what children know here in rural Montana and where I'm from in urban Florida. The idea of a one-room schoolhouse seems so far-fetched to me growing up, but then I taught in numerous examples around the state. The ideas of ocean or alligators versus crocodiles seem far-fetched to many here. We can't assume students know information that hasn't been presented. Hall thought we should teach students in the same way and to the same extent without considering where they may end up. He believed that all students are equal if they are taught equally well. He also believed that making them ready for college is not preparing them for life. He sought to match the curriculum to where children's abilities were and their interests not fit them into a curriculum. He shows up today in the idea of matching curriculum to where students are. One debate I've heard numerous times in staff meetings is whether the standards are developmentally appropriate for children. This debate seems to center on kindergarten and the idea that common core standards are too advanced for their development level. He is also present in some ways to any conversation centering around child development or educational psychology due to being the forefather of these areas. I added an extra picture from Encyclopedia Britannica of Hall with Freud, Jung, and several others to show just how pivotal and involved he was in the psycho psychological heyday of his time. We all can agree on John Dewey's profound and lasting influence on education. Despite being a man against pretty much everybody, 
taking terms and redefining them to his own ends. He was the founder of pragmatism and progressive movement in education. He forged his way on his own, for he believed that humanists and developmists were fighting over a false issue and that educators could find a curriculum that fit with a child's development. He believed that education should be centered on the child and experiential for them, for his goal was informed and engaged inquirers. A little tidbit is that his lab school at the University of Chicago was the first ever laboratory school. Dewey constructed, quoting from Clybart here, a continuum of experience, and it was the function of the course of study to move along that line from one defining point, the immediate, chaotic, but integral experience of the child, to the other defining point, the logically organized, abstract, and classified experience of the mature adult. The quote is found on page 72. His focus was on giving students authentic, hands-on opportunities to grow and learn. Since many would choose Dewey, I sought out more information on him. One fascinating read is his pedagogical creed. He simplifies what he is for because I felt Clybart spent much time on what he is against. He believes education is equally sociological and physiological. To him, education is the main method of social progress and reform, and education is therefore necessarily a social process. Today in education, you find the medium between curriculum and child development. Like I mentioned with the previous slide, there is a struggle around it with the common core standards, but the desire to make it correct is there. There is a push as well for hands-on learning and experiences to learn versus worksheets which harkens back to Dewey. A smaller aspect I see, still see today is his approach to social studies in elementary, where students start by learning about family to school to neighborhood and then further out. It follows the needs and understandings of students. He advocated it then, and most curriculums still use it today. Edward Ross was a major player in the social efficiency movement and the founder of sociology. I was surprised when learning this, for we seem to have a lot of people founding movements in this book, more than I thought. He believed that the decline of church and family meant that schools should step up to help, and that education was a weapon in society's arsenal for the good of society. Therefore, in his mind, it was necessary for good educators to be leading the way. Quoting from Clybard, Rather than decrying the loss of family influence, Ross obviously welcomes the opportunity to put the child in the hands of picked persons as one more way of curbing antisocial tendencies. This is found on pages 79 and 80. This quote was brought up in our discussion, and I highlighted it in the reading because I find it particularly spooky given today's climate. The idea that education is used as a weapon, whether for good or bad, is not one I like to consider. Yet, I feel it is obvious in our current schools. In some ways, it is good. Students with a horrible home life have the safety and security of school during the day and a teacher who hopefully cares for them. Some, though, use it to push specific views. Being a liberal in a very conservative area, I get concerned with some of the things teachers are pushing my own children to think or agree with, or things that are leaving out of the curriculum. For an extreme example that happened to our friend's older child, for the 2016 presidential election, the school held a mock election where only a handful voted for Clinton. It was made public who did vote for Clinton, and the kids were made fun of repeatedly. Instead of helping, this student's teacher made a comment the day after the election that anyone who voted for Clinton was dumb and ugly. It wasn't until multiple parents got seriously involved that this was even looked at and the teacher made to respond. However, lesser occurrences happen often and nothing is done about it. One teacher forces a boy's line, a boy's line and a girl's line. A little girl who is quite obviously non-gender conforming gets repeatedly yelled at for walking at the end of the boy's line. 
There is no harm in what she is doing and no reason for genderized lines. Instead, she is being taught or groomed a certain way by this person. I know that the reverse can be true for conservatives in liberal areas. Who gets to pick the teachers or the people that guide students' lives? This is where danger lives. So while I see some good intentions, I struggle with Ross. Bobbitt was another big player in the social efficiency movement, and his big push was to remove the waste from education. He believed that educators needed to carefully adapt curriculum to each class of individuals. He also supported the use of scientific measurement to predict the student's probable role in life in the future, and therefore, the student could get the correct curriculum. A famous quote from him that is in direct contrast to Dewey is quoting from Clybard. Education is primarily for adult life, not for child life. Its fundamental responsibility is to prepare for the 50 years of adulthood, not for the 20 years of childhood and youth. That is found on page 103. He referred to this correct curriculum as the needs they have to learn for their future. This reminded me a lot of the current practice of testing students by placing them in classes upon that, the high, medium, or low classes. We have several grades that do this with students. We are relegating them to lesser math or reading usually, and students are never able to close the gap. Teachers simply move slower through the material. The groups, once designed to be movable, have become immovable and those pushing students towards eventual tracks. I do think there is a wide and healthy debate for offering more practical classes and not making students like me interested in art take advanced math, but the idea of using testing scores or scientific data such as IQ tests to define that is deeply concerning and something that still happens in schools today. Woodward strove for a practical curriculum where skills can be in an orderly sequence and a set series of graded exercises. He founded a manual training school. Woodward viewed himself as accomplishing, quoting from the Clybard text here, the much grander vision of reconstructing the curriculum of the public schools in such a way as to redress the imbalance between the essentially literary humanist curriculum and the handwork that was a mark of modern life. That's found on pages 111 to 112. He pushed manual training based on intellectual development, but many administrators saw it as a way to train people for occupations and embraced it for that reason. His view is very similar to many I hear from teachers. Teachers say that there are those kids that are never going to college and we have a shortage of electricians, plumbers, and mechanics. They push for more hands-on training courses like these in schools to help combat the shortage. I 100% agree with offering these courses and not forcing college-bound or readiness curriculum on students not interested. But I also feel it must be up to the student to choose this path and not up to the school. I think by and large today, many appreciate the idea of tools training or manual training that Woodward piloted, but only if it is not based upon intellectual development. A portion of why I chose Dubois and the following person, Jane Addams, is because I felt the book was centered on white males. I appreciated the supplemental materials bringing in additional aspects because too often white males get credit for what females and people of color do before them or do better. W.E.B. Dubois spoke out against manual training for African Americans because they were often being denied intellectual training and professional training. Instead, educators were just training them for manual labor, which he viewed as a deliberate degradation and near return to slavery. I loved the quote from Clybard where Dubois said, Education must keep broad ideals before it, and never forget that it is dealing with souls and not with dollars. Found on page 114. This is huge to me. Today many systems view students as cogs in the wheel, or dollars even. The commercial curriculum business that keeps us bound up in the cycle of testing and new curriculum is a chief culprit. Dubois also helped to lead the movement for Pan-Africa, 
for he believed that people must resolve race relations globally if anyone wants to work locally. He also helped to create the NAACP, which is still present, active, and impacting curriculum and education today. He was an early civil rights advocate whose involvement we still feel to this day. His comments and views hit home to me that we should not relegate certain students to the background or to to specific areas of study, but rather allow them to choose the path. Jane Addams was a colleague and friend of John Dewey and a co-founder of Whole House, which was a communal living and learning experiment. One tenet that she and her friend Susan Clingsbury argued was that women have always worked and now the work was simply being redefined. They argued for not relegating women's vocational education to simply domestic science. Women should participate in the development of educational programs for other women, rather than simply men creating them. This is in large part the beginning of women's education and the first push for education beyond typical homemaker courses. We still see the debate in some areas of which careers or paths are more fitting for women. We still struggle with getting women in the science, math, and technology fields. While we have come a long way since Adam's time period, the expansion of education for women is not over in the United States, let alone the world, and we can look back to her as a foremother, so to speak. William Hurd Kilpatrick was involved with progressive education and a successor of John Dewey. He was a major player in the project method and pushed for its expansion far beyond the vocational agriculture applications of his predecessors like Snedden. He viewed the child as the key to a revitalized society and stated that, quoting Clybard, education be considered as life itself and not as a mere preparation for later living. This quote is found on page 138. He sought to integrate subjects into daily human life with students solving practical problems as a means to learn. The minute I read this section, I saw the direct line to project-based learning today. A huge current push is to learn through projects, whether it be a real garden or a fictionalized founding of a restaurant. Students are required to use math, science, language, and other skills to solve a problem or complete a project. The only difference I see is that most take place in the classroom and many are hypothetical, though related to real life today due to budgetary constraints. Just to be a bit contrary, I picked William Chandler Bagley for my final person to highlight, as he opposed progressive education and called himself an essentialist instead. He felt that the students need a more rigorous curriculum with the traditional subjects. Quoting Clybard, Bagley's quarrel was not so much with the political progressives who saw education as a potent instrument of social regeneration, but with the weak and effeminate project curriculum that robbed American children of their common cultural heritage. That's found on page 192. He focused on certain things that future citizens must know, and those should be the heart of the curriculum. He stood strongly for equality in education and was very opposed to using intelligence test scores for determining what was taught. One thing I found fascinating was he was an early experimenter with the radio for education, according to Encyclopedia Britannica, which put him at the forefront of multimodal education. The connections that I saw today with him are certain charter schools who approach themselves as traditional and rigorous and an answer to the fluff in curriculum. Also, the classical curriculum approach in general, which focuses on those traditional subjects that he highlighted. His comments on the must-knows for students reminded me of the rationale behind the Common Core standards and behind our district's goals of power standards for each grade that guarantee all students have the same skill and knowledge set that was decided is necessary for success. The language was quite similar and thus the same idea just a few decades later.